Hello and welcome to episode 87 of the official EstablishTheRun.com podcast. My name is Adam Levitan. As always, I am joined by Evan Silva. And today we are joined by one of our favorite people in the industry, one of your favorite people in, this, in the industry. This is a young man who loves fear and loathing, much like I do. A young man getting too old to camp out at fish shows. A young man who has somehow finished in the top 10 of the accuracy rankings contest in four of the last six years. I have no idea how. We're going to find out. A young man who prefers studying snaps and pace to intercourse. It is Pat Thorman. Pat, what's going on, buddy? Oh, man, things are good. Things are good. That was a hell of an intro. I, it almost sounds like I know what I'm doing. Uh, are you denying preferring snaps and pace to intercourse, or are you concurring? Oh, I am in my 40s, um, and snaps and pace is pretty exciting. So uh, <laughs> we'll, we'll just no comment that one. <laughs> Evan, what's going on? What's going on, guys? I'm ready to, ready to chop it up with Pat Thorman, the great, great, great Pat Thorman. Yeah, so uh, on today's show, we are going to talk about pace outlooks for this season that have been affected by coaching changes, personnel changes, maybe game flow changes. But before we get to that, I think we would be remiss if we didn't take this chance to talk to Pat about rankings because somehow, and I don't really know how, as I mentioned, he dominates these accuracy ranking metrics every year. And we're talking about in-season, weekly, uh, stardom, sit -em type stuff for season-long people, which I know uh, you guys really do love. So I guess that's the first question, Pat. What is the process for ranking so accurately during the season? Uh, well, it's, 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 a lot of, it's a lot of tinkering. It's, it's kind of an analog process. Um, you know, I don't really have a real, real fancy uh, model going on. But, um, you know, it starts Sunday night, you know, watching the game, pulling together the, uh, the stats from the day, um, you know, the snaps and the uh, time of possession and stuff. Um, and that kind of helps me pull together my article um, and, uh, you know, see which, you know, games that the matchups coming up are going to be uh, fast paced or slow paced, which you want to, you know, target and avoid and what players are going to benefit from that. And that kind of puts together my initial rankings list. And from there, it's, it's just like absorb as much information as I can, um, you know, from, you know, uh, injuries and playing time to uh, matchups and air yards and, and kind of just take a little bit every time and tinker and, you know, lay in bed and read something and tinker and have some margaritas and tinker and, you know, just, all the way up to right till kickoff on Sunday. And I know so that could be frustrating sometimes to our subscribers, subscribers that uh, on Sunday mornings, I'll make like a switch in the rankings, but I mean, we're getting inf new information right up until kickoff. So you just got to be open to, you know, making changes and, and, and do the best you can as far with the information that you have. Yeah. I, I would be skeptical of a non data driven process for a lot of sports, but not for football. Like I think people like Evan and Pat who actually are like in this and like so deep in it can actually do it better uh, on a week-to-week -week basis than a lot of statistical models could. So I, I actually agree that it's probably at least mostly the right process to just absorb as much as you can, and you have so much experience doing this. It's a good way to do it. I'm curious how you weigh maybe matchups versus players' baseline. So, like, everybody's going to say stuff like, I can't play this guy against the Steelers' defense. I can't play that guy against the 49ers. To me, that's, like, the hardest part of doing weekly rankings when we have a guy who we know is good uh, or we know is bad and he just has a matchup either extremely in his favor or not in his favor. How do you weigh matchups versus a guy's baseline? Yeah, and, and in particular, like shadow cornerback situations too. Like you, like you definitely take that into account. You don't, you don't want to ignore it um, entirely and, and just say defenses don't matter. Shout out to Josh Hermsmeyer. Um, but, you know, you, you can't, you know, over, over uh, weight something like that. And you don't want to count something twice too because, you know, if you look at, um, you know, totals and you say this is going to be a high scoring game and then you look at the cornerback matchups and he's like, oh, this guy's, you know, getting, you know, defended by, you know, a crappy cornerback. Like you don't want to just keep pushing him up your rankings over and over again um, and start counting the same things twice. Yeah. Um, okay. I think another issue with rankings that people have is when they don't know, right? Like we don't know exactly how Tampa Bay's running back situation is going to go. We might not know uh, uh, how the Patriots running back situation is going to go in a given week. What is optimal when you're doing weekly rankings for ambiguous backfield type situations? Well, I'm, I'm, I'm probably skew a little more on the conservative side. Um, and um, a lot of these ranking contests um, punish you pretty hard if, if you go out on a limb some, with somebody and either they get hurt or you're just flat out wrong. Um, so just in the name of, of, of not kind of putting yourself too far out there. Like, you don't, you don't want to really, really jack a guy up or, 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 or down. 
Um, so I, I just kind of conservative, kind of rank a little bit toward the median and um, we move the stuff on concrete information. Um, so even like with the seasonal rankings, like, you know, we're talking, we're talking about the Bucks backfield um, and, you know, Ronald Jones put on a little bit of weight and his calves are popping. And like, these are stuff, this is stuff that you really, you know, you can kind of just take with a grain of salt. And even, even Bruce Arians quote yesterday in, in you know, August before these guys have touched each other. So, I mean, you take that with a little bit of grain of salt. Well, that's got a little more concrete than, the, you know, the calf thing. Um, but if you hear that Tom Brady is, is, is saying that, you know, he's looking good and he's doing good in pass protection, or if, you know, Pat Corrine rides an elevator with Arians, then, you know, that's the concrete information to really jack Ronald Jones up. Uh, Evan, we should get your take on this Ronald Jones story from yesterday before we move on with Pat. Uh, uh, Bruce Arians, who has been known to blow a lot of smoke up a lot of asses about a lot of players in his career, comes out yesterday and says, hey, listen, there's no doubt Ronald Jones is our guy. LaShawn McCoy is going to come in and compete for a pass down role. We talked about this on the like two episodes ago, maybe. Uh, that was a take that we had as well. I don't believe you moved Ronald Jones in your rankings at all. What did you make of Bruce Arians' comments uh, yesterday? Oh, I moved him. I moved him. He's, he's a top 70 player now. He, uh, he went from RB36 to RB31. I mean, we're not going to be working with very much information that this, you know, heading into the season. And I think, I think about it like my mock draft, which this year was terrible. And usually I rely on, you know, just knowing which beat writers have actual, you know, information that is actionable. And, you know, there just wasn't, there was no pro day circuit. There was no, you know, there, there, there was no real uh, strong buzz and chatter uh, leading into uh, the, the the draft, and and I just I totally blew it on my mock draft. And um, you know, heading into this season, Pat and I were actually texting about this the other night. Um, you know, there there's just going to be so little. There's no preseason games. I mean, that's been a big edge of ours. Like we, you know, over the years, um, headlined by you, Adam. You know, going through and charting all the the first team snaps in the preseason games. That we're not going to have that this year. So. We're going to be working with a lot less uh, tangible information, and coach speak, unfortunately, is probably going to move the um, move the move the pendulum a little bit more than it usually would. Um, with you know all that said, Keyshawn Vaughn ha is falling behind. LaShawn McCoy, they just signed and has looked like dust now for two seasons in a row. Um, Dari Ogunbowale is you know a borderline NFL player. Ronald Jones. You know, there, there is, there is definite, like, tangible, tangible reason to believe that Ronald Jones is going to lead this backfield in usage. And the coach coming out and saying it adds to that confidence level. You know, I'm not going to put him as a top 50 player. You know, we're, I'm, I'm not going to put him as a top 20 running back. But I want to have him in a position where people that are using our rankings have a pretty good shot at getting him. And now I think that they do. Yeah. Ronald Jones stock's certainly going up, and I saw his – at least his ADP is going up. I saw him go in the fifth or sixth round of some drafts lately. So he's really – you're going to have to start paying a premium for Ronald Jones. We can get more into that later. I do want to get into some of Pat's player takes for this season before we talk snaps and pace, which is really the primary reason. Pat, you are higher than market on Brandon Cooks, and I thought this one was interesting because Evan and I have been so high on Will Fuller. We have not spent a lot of time – on Brandon Cooks. Brandon Cooks comes in way cheaper than Will Fuller for what it's worth. I don't even know what Brandon Cooks ADP is. It's probably in the double digit rounds, right? Talk to the people about why you're on Brandon Cooks. Well, I mean, he's, he's a great, first of all, he's a great fit with Watson. I mean, Watson was, led the league in accurate, accuracy percentage on deep balls last year. Um, Cooks obviously get downfield. Um, meanwhile, Cooks last year had 35% catchable target rate on deep balls. Um, while the Texans receivers had a 57% catchable target rate on deep balls. Um, so he's going to, you know, he should jibe pretty well with Watson and he's stackable with Watson. You're not, you're not really able to stack Fuller and Watson very often. They're going off the board at about the same time. You, you got a couple rounds between where, where Watson and, and Cooks are going. Um, so, I mean, he's kind of, he, he's <laughs> at the risk of pissing you guys off. He's kind of the arbitrage Will Fuller, really. Um, you know, they're both 26. They both have injury prone labels, but, you know, Cooks has missed two of his last 80 games. Fuller's missed a third of his games in, in the league. So um, I do have Fuller higher. Um, I would rather draft Fuller, but I do got, I got a lot more Cooks. Yeah. And Cooks certainly has a long concussion history, which is a little bit scary, but he's been extremely productive when he's been on the field. We haven't spent a lot of time on Brandon Cooks, Evan. What's your Brandon Cooks take for this year? I like him, um, but I've been just smashing the button on Will Fuller, you know, so that leads me away from Cooks a little bit. He's usually, he's usually like 
within my range when, when I'm on the clock, but he'll be like, you know, the fifth guy um, in my queue usually. So I, I really don't have that much of Brandon Cooks, but I, I totally get it. Um, you know, it, it is a wide receiver changing teams, but it's also a wide receiver that has a ton of theoretical big playability matching up with a quarterback that, you know, will sit back in the pocket and hold the ball for six seconds waiting for a guy to come open. Like, how long can you cover Brandon Cooks? You know, you, you really can't cover him uh, that long. So I do think that he is an excellent best ball pick. Um, and I think he's definitely going to mix in his share of big weeks. You know, over his last 16 games, he really hasn't been productive, though. He's below 700 yards. Uh, there are a lot of injury-shortened games mixed in there. Um, I, I prefer Fuller because of that established connection, uh, for sure. But um, I think that Cooks is an excellent best ball pick. Yeah. By the way, we've released a ton of best ball content in the draft kit, which is just $34.99. I hope you guys will check it out. We put a lot of work into all the best ball stuff that's now up on DraftKings and underdog. You can play best ball in, which I think is one of the best ways to get ready for the season. I know Thorman does a crap load of best ball drafts. I think it's one of the best ways to actually be sharp for both DFS and, and for season long to draft best ball teams. Um, uh, another note on this Texans offense that um, is just, just – you know, flush with, uh, with speed on the perimeter. I mean, they they really did remake their, their receiver core this off season. Um, the offensive line. Now, if the offensive line, which returns all five starters, Brandon, I think is relatively upbeat on their offensive line. You know, that, that I think could really help a guy like Brandon cooks last year playing in the Rams offense where they couldn't protect. And Jared Goff is just, just melts when he, when he experiences any sort of pressure you know, that was a really tough situation for Brandon Cooks to thrive in. I mean, he, he you know, he had a big first year with the Rams and then he really, um, he fell off last year. And I think a lot of it had to do with the offensive environment. If the Texans can have a legitimately good offensive line, which it, it does seem like Brandon thinks that they could, um, that could be a really big boost to, to Brandon Cooks in terms of changing his offensive environment it could be a really big upgrade. All right. Let's go to one that people are going to say yawn, Thorman. People are going to say yawn. I don't, carry on Johnson, yawn. Uh, Evan and I took carry on Johnson in, in this uh, kind of modified zero RB. We ran an FFPC. Uh, talk to the people about carry on Johnson. I mean, you can usually get him, I think, in like seventh, eighth, ninth round. Uh, talk to people about carry on. Yeah, you can get him in the ninth round. I mean, he's, and, he's, and he's boring. And, and people think he's injury prone. Um, so no one really wants to, you know, hit the button on him. Um, but he's going to have a, he's going to have a role, especially early uh, with the screwed up off season. Um, and he's, he's, he's been a quality back and he's good in pass protection. So that's going to help him get on the field, especially early. Um, even if you're doing like a modified zero RB build, um, he's a guy who can get you through as an RB two until those other zero RB candidates start popping. Um, no, Swift's obviously going to play. He's a borderline first round pick. Um, but I mean, he's not going to have the lion's share of, of the, of the, uh, of the workload at, at least, at least to start. So I think carry on is, is, is a useful pick and um, he's cheap enough that, that he's not really going to hurt you, even if he misses. And, and I think we all agree that this is going to be a good offense, right? So yeah. we, we sort of, we want to invest in the lion's offense um, and carry on is one of the cheapest ways to do so. And probably the, the single most undervalued way to do so. He's a good player. This team was on pace to finish top four in, um, uh, in, in, in offensive yards and top eight in scoring last year uh, until Matthew Stafford got hurt. They're bringing back the same OC, Daryl Bevel, who I think did, did an excellent job in, in his first season. As Even with, you know, the David Blau and Jeff Driscoll, those guys that they were trotting out in the second half, um, Daryl Bevel, I think, did a, did a great job in his first year as the Lions OC. And um, I, I, I like investing in this offense. Yeah, I, I actually prefer the ambiguous backfields to straight handcuffs. So if I'm looking for like late round running backs, I, you know, I get that Alexander Madison and Chase Edmonds and Tony Pollard are all good picks and, and I'm fine with them if there's an injury that's just a total smash. Ambiguous backfields like Indy or Tampa or Detroit are also at least equally interesting, if not more to me, because we just don't know. I think there's overconfidence. And Thorman's pointed this out with ADPs. There's just overconfidence in gaps between players. Like, are we really that sure that DeAndre Swift's going to play that far ahead of on Johnson where there's like a six-round gap or, or whatever? Um, okay. I want to mention this Henry Ruggs news before we move on to some guys that Thorman is down on. So Evan and I have talked plenty about how we were, we've been higher than market on Henry Ruggs all offseason. I've been taking Henry Ruggs a ton like 10th, 11th 
round. But I was under the impression that the starting alignment for the Raiders was going to be Tyrell Williams, the gazelle, and Henry Ruggs on the outside, Hunter Renfro in the slot. For what it's worth, yesterday, Greg Olson, Raiders OC, says Henry Ruggs will actually be our slot guy. And that kind of raised my eyebrows, right? And I guess that means that they want to play Brian Edwards on the outside, which means they'd be starting two rookie wide receivers in a COVID offseason. So I'm not sure how much I buy this. Either way, just the idea that they want to use Henry Ruggs in the slot and get this guy who I know is very, very, very explosive after the catch and try to get him in space maybe, maybe that's a good idea. What do you think about the news or the alleged news, at least the quote, that Henry Ruggs is going to play some slot, Evan? Um, I'm actually pretty skeptical of it. Uh, I think that the way that they envision – I mean, in the West Coast offense, that Z receiver is Deshaun Jackson, um, Tyreek Hill. And they do end up playing in the slot a lot. Uh, Tyreek Hill, I think, as a rookie, I think he was 50-50 outside uh, versus slot. I mean, I think that Henry Ruggs is going to be in the slot quite a bit. I I don't think that he's going to be like their full-time slot receiver. They want to play multiple tight ends. Uh, They have a fullback on the roster. Um, I, I, I think this is going to turn into a lot of hype for Brian Edwards and uh, not a lot is going to come, you know, not, not a lot of that, of that is going to come to fruition. Henry uh, Hunter Renfro was like the best receiver on the team last year. Um, I, you know, I can see just not taking him in fantasy because he's freaking Hunter Renfro, but um, you know, we, we should probably adjust down expectations a little bit for him. Um, especially if he's not going to be on the field in two receiver sets. And if they're running a bunch of uh, multiple tight ends or playing a fullback, um, you know, we're playing Lynn Bowden, uh, then, you know, they're, they're going to have uh, f- uh, fewer situations where they're in three receiver sets. So um, I think we should adjust down Hunter Renfro a little bit, but I think it's good news for Henry Ruggs. I'm just I'm not buying like Brian Edwards as a staple in their in their three receiver packages or as like a, a player who's going to play more than 40 percent of the snaps. I'll say two things. Uh, first, I'm kind of disappointed because I think this news is going to bump up Henry Ruggs ADP. And so now he's going to go from 10th or 11th round. People are going to start taking him in the eighth round based on this news, which I agree with Evan is not that impactful. I already wanted to be. Uh, higher than market on rugs. And second of all, one of the most egregious lines, I'm working on an article for the draft kit now about season long player props. One of the most egregious lines you can find right now. And I hope it's still out there by the time this comes out. I mean, Henry Ruggs, uh, I'm sorry, Hunter Renfro under 700 and a half receiving yards for the season. is just, I mean, it just shows how laughable some of these player prop uh, lines are. So that was available on DraftKings, uh, even at minus 110. Uh, and even now with this news, I think it's even better. Uh, Thorman, do you still want to stay? Because let's project a one to two round ADP bump on Henry Ruggs. Do you still want to stay above market on Henry Ruggs if he starts going in the eighth round or so? Um, I mean, I, I, I guess I can see it in best ball because, you know, you're not going to have to worry about starting him every week. But, I mean, this is a low-volume offense. I mean, they were 24th in place per game last year. They were 26th in pace, and they were 29th in pass rate. So even if you assume they, they, they go a little bit faster and they throw a little bit more, I mean, just on a volume standpoint, um, it, it's just not something that you're going to be able to play a guy week in and week out. Um, and, and especially with, you know, Carr being so risk averse and, and you know, 30, 30th in deep percentage, 34th and ADOT. Um, I guess if he is in the slot, it puts him in, in Carr's range a little bit more and, and that's, that would be good. But I mean, I'm pretty down on most of these guys from a volume standpoint, including Darren Waller. Um, I, just, I just don't think that, especially with them adding some pass catch and running backs and a couple of receivers, I'm just not sure there's enough pass volume in this offense to support a lot of these guys' ADPs. But um, Ruggs, where he is now, is interesting. But, you know, pushing him up a little, couple rounds, it, it, I start to question it. Yeah. We, as we mentioned them in two podcasts ago, we did move Evan Ingram above Dale, Darren Waller in the rankings across the board. Uh, okay. Let's get to some guys that Pat is lower on the market. And these guys, people are not going to be happy with you, Pat, because people are very excited about these guys. People are very excited about Kyler Murray and Clyde Edwards-Hilaire. And you, my friend, say you do not want to be in on these guys at their current prices. Let's start with Kyler Murray before we get to the hot take cannon on Clyde Edwards-Hilaire. Uh, go ahead on Kyler Murray. 
I mean, I'm not, I'm not that far off consensus with Murray. I'm, I'm, I got him in QB six and he's going QB three or four on, in most drafts. Um, I think consensus is QB five. So it's not, it's not like a, it's not like a huge, hugely hot take here. Um, I just think people are a little bit ahead of themselves and where they think this offense is going to be, especially in terms of how often they're going to pass. I mean, they threw it a 69% clip um, in the first month of the season last year, and then they dialed it all the way down to 56% um, for the rest of the season when their running game started going. Um, with a bad offensive line and, and, and a good scheme. And, and there's really not much of a reason for them to go away from that. Um, obviously, they, they, they brought in Hopkins, and, and, and that's going to that, that's gonna help, obviously, even though it's his first year on a new team. Um, but I just, I just don't think they're going to have the, as much you know, pace and play volume as people are expecting. And I trust Dak, and I trust Russ, and I trust Watson more than I do Murray at this point. Um. Evan, where are you at on Kyler Murray right now relative to the other quarterbacks at the top? Uh, he's in the second tier. The first tier is just two quarterbacks, Patrick Mahomes and Lamar Jackson. Kyler Murray is in the second tier with guys like Deshaun Watson and Russell Wilson and uh, MVP Josh Allen. Uh, but, but Kyler Murray is at the bottom of that tier. And if you're using the rankings, you are not going to be – if you're using the top 150 or the tiers, you're not going to be getting – Kyler Murray in all likelihood this year. And my take is very, very similar on Kyler Murray to Pat's. Um, but I did want to ask Pat one question. So in weeks, I believe it was one through six, and we've talked about this with the projection staff and, and Wiggins, and they think I'm crazy for having DeAndre Hopkins at like wide receiver 14. You know, they're like, we can't justify him any lower than wide receiver nine in the projections. <laughs> <laughs> and... Um, <laughs> You know, so we, we, we've had some arguments about that. But, I mean, I, I do – at the end of the day, I think it comes back to, again, the offensive environment and being lower than consensus on Kyler Murray as well. But Wiggins did make a good point that, hey, early in the season last year, the Cardinals were running at a very fast pace. And then they decided to slow it down because, hey, they're, you know, their passing offense is comprised of, like, Demir Bird, Trent Sherfield, you know, the um, – the, the, the corpse of, of Larry Fitzgerald, you know, et cetera. Christian Kirk got hurt, you know, all this. They're playing Max Williams. And um, so they really slowed it down, right? But could they get back to being an offense that is like, you know, competing to lead the league in plays run? They finished 22nd last year in, in offensive plays. Can they get back to doing what they, what they seemingly wanted to do, certainly entering the season and early in the season? And – could, could that put us in a position where being lower on Kyler Murray and being lower on DeAndre Hopkins could really come back to bite us if they're like leading the league in offensive plays? Um, well, I mean, it, it, it certainly could. Um, but I mean, they, they, were, they were so down in plays per game after that first month. They were, they were 25th. They were running 61 plays a game versus 71.5 in the first month. So, I mean, that, that's an enormous gap. So even if they come somewhere back in, in, in between the two, um, I, I just, I don't see why they would, I mean, they played better. They were 0-4 in the first month. Um, why, why would they go back to that and, and have Kyler throwing the ball, you know, 40 times a game? Um, I, I, I mean, they, they certainly could. They brought in Hopkins. They, they, have, they have a better supporting cast there. Maybe the offensive line's a little bit better. But the offensive, offensive line sucked last year. Um, and, and the running game was still really good. I mean, their three running backs all ran top 15 in yards before contact. I mean, David Johnson was 15th. The other two were fourth and eighth. Um, so they were super successful with a bad O line. I think that was what they did best last year. So I'm not sure they're going to swing the pendulum all the way back to what they were doing early in the season, even, even with Hopkins, especially with a, with a, with a short off season. Um, so it, it's, it, it's kind of a projection on, on there, but um, I, I just, I just don't see them playing with their hair on fire like they did last September. Yeah. Pulled up Evan's top 150, which he's constantly updating for you guys. He has Kyler right behind Russell Wilson and Josh Allen, as he said, all in the same tier there, right behind them. And I think there's a pretty big tier drop off, as you mentioned. Kyler Murray, Evan's QB7, down to Matt Ryan, who is Evan's QB8. Um, okay, Clyde Edwards Hilaire. We've spoken to Evan and I talked about Clyde Edwards Hilaire two episodes ago. You are lower than Mark and Clyde Edwards Hilaire. There's some people out there who think Clyde Edwards Hilaire should be like a top three pick now. There's other people who think he should be going in the second round. I think he's going to settle in with an ADP somewhere between like the six to nine range or something like that. Where are you at on this new situation with Damian Williams gone in Kansas City, Pat? I mean, 
<laughs> I, I think the top three is, is pretty crazy. Um, we're talking about a 12 team league here. Like I heard Evan said that, you know, he went one on one. I mean, if that's a large field tournament and you, you know, want to embrace some variance and, 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 and take a shot on ceiling, then I, I can understand that. But in a 12 team league, putting him above uh, Kamara or Cooks or, or Mixon or the big dog, just it seems like you're embracing a lot of unknown there. Um, versus, you know, you have a stud that you, you know is going to get plenty of workload on, on good teams. Um, we don't know who's going to get the ball in the goal line. We don't know how much uh, D'Angelo Washington is going to play. I mean, they're, they're the same size. D'Angelo Washington's a pretty good back. He's more athletic. They, and we don't know if they're going to sign a veteran. Um, it, it's, there's just too much unknown for me to put him above established players that are on good offenses, that we have locked in workloads. Um, and, you know, we'll, we'll – and in an in, in off season that we're not even going to see him play a preseason game. Mm -hmm. So it, it's just, it's a little bit too aggressive for me to, to, to put him um, anywhere near the top three. Um, I think I got him at RB 10, um, which probably a little lower than most, but um, I just, I need to have a little more concrete information before I'm passing up legit studs in the first round. Yeah. Evan, you've done some drafts since the Damian Williams news. Where, where has he been going and what do you think about it? Every time before I pick, you know, certainly. I mean, I, I, I have him RB8, I think. And so I'm even higher than, than Thorman is on him. And he's still not – I mean, I'm not com coming close to getting him. You know, again, I, I, I mentioned that he went 101 in that one draft. He, like, always goes in the top five or six at worst. And um, you know, I'm, I'm not getting him. Right. Yeah. Okay. That's not to say, you know, like everything's value based. I don't want people to come out of here and say, like, we hate Clyde Edwards Lair. He's going to have a bad year. I don't think people realize, like, mm -hmm. how much opportunity there cost there is in the top five or six picks of a fantasy draft. Like, it's just, it's just wild. If he was going in the second round, obviously it's a total smash. But, you know, as we mentioned in the bus episode, we should think of everything through the lens of a market. All right. Snaps and pace, Pat. Let's get to the reason that, that you are here. Again, quick synopsis of why it matters. I think it should be obvious at this point, but plays per game when you're doing any kind of projection if you're just watching a game you can see when teams play fast how much more opportunity there is uh, when teams are able to rip off more plays to have fantasy points I mean it's not rocket science at all however it is difficult to try to project how many plays per game how fast a team is going to play so we're going to run through some teams here with Pat and get his take on whether they'll play faster or slower than this year a lot of this is going to be coaching changes some of his personnel changes let's start with the Dallas Cowboys made the move away from Jason Garrett, Mike McCarthy is in, still same OC in Kellen Moore. What are you projecting for pace for the Dallas Cowboys, who, by the way, led the entire NFL in yards per play last year? Yep, and they led the, they led the NFL in, in just in, uh, in, in yards, and, and, and they were second in pace. I mean, you can kind of feel, the, feel it building over the last five years. They were in the 30s uh, four or five years ago as far as rankings for pace. They were in the 20s um, you know, two and three years ago, and, and, and last year they just, they just they blew it out. Um, and like their no huddle rate over the last five years has gone from the low twenties ranking up to eighth. And you got Mike McCarthy, who over the last five years with the Packers ranked inside the top ten in no huddle rate every single year. They ranked third a couple times. Um, so then you look at the Cowboys' plays per game. They went 29th, 20th, 18th, 11th, and last year they were sixth. So then that's a big reason why they led the league in yards last year. And they they had more yards um, than they scored points. I mean, as far as you know, relative basis. So I mean, there's even some room for improvement. And then you got a defense who was, wasn't great last year and, and is probably going to be worse this year that had a lot of turnover in a, in a weird offseason. And the offense is, I mean, everyone looks at Lamb and they, they got C.D. Lamb and that's a, that's a big improvement. But the rest of the offense is fairly intact. You know, they're placing their center and they're placing their tight end. But that tight end was there last year making plays anyway. So this is going to be an explosive environment, not just for the Cowboys, but if they play at a pace that they played last year, it's going to be an explosive environment for whoever they're playing. Um, so that's just, we're going to want parts of, of, of them and, and, and their opponents. Hey surprisingly stackable Evan like you can get Amari pretty easily in the third round sometimes the fourth I think you can get Michael Gallup late you can get Blake Jarwin late uh Dak I think is uh probably at cost and Zeke is at cost but it's not that hard to stack this team I know you've tried to do that lately and Thorman talking about the pace only makes me more excited about Dallas it just seems really hard for them to fail yeah I'm so excited about this offense this year um I've done, yeah, I did a tweet the other day that I had done like th uh, three drafts in the, in the previous two days and I stacked Cowboys in two of them. Um, like you said, it was very feasible. One of them had Tony Pollard at the back end, um, but I don't mind taking a shot on, on his upside in like the 10th or 11th round. Um, I also like the schedule 
uh, as the Cowboys open the season. Uh, week one is going to be in L.A. against the Rams, who lost a ton of defensive talent, and Wade Phillips, who I think is a true difference maker, defensive coordinator. Week two, back home facing the Falcons. Let's go. Uh, week three in Seattle, uh, who just – they're not going to be able to rush the passer at all. Uh, and they're not going to have – you know, there's probably not going to be fans in the stands, right? So they're not going to have that, that 12th man element. Back home for three straight home games – against the Browns, Giants, and Cardinals. Let's go. Uh, and then at the Eagle – I'm sorry, and then at the Redskins, not, not too scary. And then at the Eagles, who, you know, every year we look at their defense and we're like, oh, they should be better this year. But every year we just pound them uh, with passing games. So uh, I, I really like the schedule in addition to all the pace factors, the talent, the continuity, bringing back the OC, bringing back the QB1, the RB1, the wide receiver one, the wide receiver two, um, you know, four or five offensive line starters. I mean, this is, you know, th this is it, man. If, 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 if this doesn't work at, you know, we, we should retire. <laughs> oh God, don't, don't say that. They're going to, they're going to clip, they're going to clip that on us. I'm not ready to retire. But, uh, okay. The Cincinnati Bengals, Pat, Zach Taylor is back with, of course, a uh, new quarterback in Joe Burrow, a new wide receiver in, T. Higgins getting Jonah Williams back. Like, there's a lot of personnel upgrades in this offense. What do you think since he's going to do from a snaps and pace perspective? I'm, I'm pretty excited. I mean, you could see it last year with Zach Taylor. I mean, you can see that influence from when he was with the Rams and when he was with Sean McVay. And they were, they were seventh in situation neutral snaps pace. Um, they, they threw the ball at the fifth highest clip on a situation neutral basis. They went from 32nd and 30th in plays per game to ninth. And so now you bring in Burrow, and he's, he, he, has, he can unlock all those good weapons that they have. Um, I mean, he's, he's a guy who played at LSU. They played with pace. They had good play volume, even though they were blowing teams out. Um, and, and as much as I like the Cincinnati defense as like a late defensive sleeper in fantasy, uh, there's not going to be a big problem with the, the Bengals blowing teams out. So um, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty excited about them from, from a pace angle. Yeah, the, the defensives in this AFC North, I think, are good. And it concerns me somewhat. You know, Cincy, I think, underrated defense. Pittsburgh, obviously, very good. Ravens, obviously, very good. So six games against them does concern me for Cincy. But I do like the talent here and certainly underrated to me, skill core. Uh, Evan, what do you think about what's going on with Cincy and Pace? Yeah, and also Joe Burrow played in the super up-tempo offense at LSU. So he knows how to run that. He's probably most comfortable uh, playing at that, at that sort of pace. So, yeah, this is – I mean, this is one of the reasons that I've stayed, you know, real high on Joe Mixon. Um, and, I mean, I, I still can't talk myself into taking A.J. Green. But, I mean, I think that Tyler Boyd is a solid pick. Um, you know, and, and I think that Joe Burrow is, is a real intriguing QB, yeah. too. It's just the schedule. Um, you know, all the defenses within the division are, are, are pretty darn good. Um, so, he, you know, he's not going to have a lot, of, a lot of cupcakes this year. For sure. All right. Let's get to some slower, some teams who might be slowing down, uh, Pat. The uh, Indianapolis Colts went from Jacoby Brissett to Phillip Rivers. They used second round draft capital on Jonathan Taylor. They still have one of the NFL's best offensive lines. What's going to happen from a pace perspective with the Colts? Yeah, that's the big question is how much is Phil Rivers going to influence Frank Reich to, uh, to go back to his uh, 2018 situation where they, they were second in pace, second in pass percentage, and, and, and third in plays when they had Andrew Luck. But, I mean, if you look at last year, um, they, they were 25th in, in pace. They were 30th in pass rate and 18th in plays per game. Um, they're projected for another win and a half. They got the easiest schedule based on 2020, you know, win totals. Like you mentioned, they had O-line is awesome. Their return's intact. And, and they got a pretty strong backfield. So, I mean, if they want to play slow, and they did last year for more reasons probably – then they thought that was the optimal thing because they were probably protecting Brissett a little bit. But if they want to play slow, they have the personnel and they have the, um, the schedule and everything else to do it. Um, it's just a matter of what Phil Rivers is going to inspire Frank Reich to do. Yeah, my take on the Colts last year was they knew that Jacoby Brissett wasn't it and they were just trying to like hide him as much as possible. I, I, but at this point in his career, I'm not sure Phil Rivers is it either. Maybe you could talk a little bit about what you think Phil Rivers has left in the tank, Evan, and how that might affect how they play. I mean, I'm just like everyone else. I watched a lot of Philip Rivers last year, and there were definite, definitely moments where I was like, uh, you know, I just I, I don't know what he's got left. But now he's going to play indoors. He's playing by the, uh, behind the best offensive line he's played in like, like a legit decade. Um, he's working with, you know, an excellent offensive coach, I think, in Frank Reich. They're going to be able to be multiple 
uh, with, you know, multiple uh, tight end packages. Uh, they've definitely got some explosiveness in receiver with T.Y. Hilton back, uh, knock on wood, healthy. Michael Pittman, Paris Campbell is back healthy. Um, but, yeah, I think that the, the, just the, the schedule and – how everything sets up. They traded up for a running back. They're bringing back Marlon Mack, who last year was top 10 in, uh, in rushing yards per game. Um, and then that studly offensive line where they're bringing back all the starters. I think that the, it sets up to be a run-heavy team. Um, but I think that they'll, they'll, they're going to take shots downfield at T.Y. Hilton for sure. Um, and Phillip Rivers, you know, even though I don't know what's left of his arm, he's not going to be afraid to, to put it up there and let you know, T.Y. Hilton and, um, and Michael Pittman go get it. Yeah. One, I'm more, pretty worried. one more one more note on, on Rivers is over the last several years in, in San Diego or LA, um, they went slow. I mean, I don't know how much of it was his preference, how much of it was the line sucking, um, but they went real slow. Um, so I'm not sure if Rivers is gonna come in and, and be like, you know, I, I wanna play fast. Um, but that's also another thing that you know we just we need to wait till week one to find out how they approach it because we're not gonna get that information until then. Yeah. Also, their defense, I think, has a chance to take a, a leap. I mean, they acquired DeForest Buckner. They're bringing back Eberflus, who, you know, has gotten some head coaching interest. And um, I think their defense can take a, a pretty sizable leap this year. They, they, Chris Ballard has been saying that what they've really been missing on their defense is that difference-making three-technique defensive tackle. And that's, you know, DeForest Buckner is like a top five three-tech in the league. Um. Yeah, I'm sure no surprise to anybody who's listening, but I, I'm pretty sure that it's tent time for Philip Rivers. And so uh, I, I, think, I think that it's over. Uh, oh, and by the way, um, <laughs> when I was doing my, my, uh, my uh, defense uh, tiers article, like the Colts by far have the best schedule from weeks one through six. Like they're, they're like my favorite uh, last round uh, uh, fantasy defense because yeah. of that schedule. Yeah, if you guys didn't see it, we did add Evan's defensive tiers to the draft kit. Those are up uh, now under the rest of the tiers. Uh, okay, let's talk Packers. I mean, Packers are very clearly shifting away from an Aaron Rodgers-centric to a run-centric um, offense. And he might be tilted about it. I, I don't know. We saw them kind of spike up in plays at times last year when they got into these wild shootouts, but they're going to try to keep those fewer and far between. I think that's clear, but just how slow can Green Bay play, Pat, and how much is Aaron Rodgers going to put up with that? Well, yeah, that, that's the question. I mean, the numbers aren't as stark as, as some of the other teams. Um, they, they were 10th in situation neutral pass rate last year, but that's coming, coming down from third um, in McCarthy's last year, which is another, another good nugget for Dak. Um, and their place per game went from 9th to 13th, um, but their pace stayed about the same, you know, just, just below average. They were in 18th and 19th over the last two years. I mean, but like you said, the worry comes from the personnel moves they made, um, you know, what they did in the draft, what they didn't do in free agency, um, and what Matt LaFleur did in his last season in Tennessee when they were 23rd in pace and 29th in plays and 30th in pass rate. Um, so it's just, it's not something, not, not, a, not a team that I really want to be investing heavily in, you know, beyond, you know, Devontae Adams, who I think is going to get his, but these ancillary pieces, um, you're just not sure how much volume that they're going to get in, in their passing game. Yeah. Yeah, I know. Evan doesn't like taking Alan Lazard in like the 12th round like I do. But yeah, it's certainly an argument against him is that they are going to play slow and try to be run centric. I just it's just hard for me to see Aaron Rodgers really putting up with that. But yeah, I know we've talked about Green Bay a lot. Evan, anything to add? No, just Aaron Rodgers is not a good fantasy quarterback anymore. OK. Jordan Love season. Um all right, last one we're going to hit on is the New York Giants. And I think this one is interesting, man, because I, I compare Daniel Jones to Jameis and to Josh Allen from a perspective of not that good in real life, but in fantasy has some serious, serious upside. And we saw it last year with Daniel Jones, four games with more than 30 DK points in just 12 starts. You know, I want to be in on this offense. I think that they have a really good uh, skill set by far. I mean, you know, if you add Evan Ingram in there and if you think Darius Slayton is good to add to the guys they already have, I mean, this is a really good offense with a quarterback who can generate spiked weeks. However, we have Jason Garrett coming to town and we have at least a, an opening schedule that is very difficult in the first, I don't know, four or five weeks or so. So there's definitely concerns on Danny Dimes and company. Where are you at with the Giants, Thorman? Uh, I, 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 is it okay to say I, I, I don't know? Um, because 
there's conflicting kind of you know, signals here. I mean, they played really fast last year, but obviously Joe Judge is there this year. And he was with the Patriots, and, and they go really fast, but he was mostly a special teams coach. And the defense is going to suck. So that kind of lends itself to, you know, offensive explosions and, and going quickly. But are they going to try to kind of hide the defense? And then you got an offensive coordinator who's really good at trying to hide defenses in Jason Garrett. So there's just a lot of – of unknown here in which direction they're going to go. And um, maybe a preseason would have helped us solve this. Um, most likely we would have need to go to the regular season. Um, I think my best guess is sometimes they're going to try to protect the defense. Most of the time they're not going to be able to, and that's going to pull them into plenty of shootouts as well. Yeah. I know you're worried about Jason Garrett, Jason Garrett, uh, Evan, any further comments on the giants? No, but just to reiterate, like you essentially can't draft Daniel Jones in a season long redraft league because you can't use him in the first three weeks. He's almost certainly going to hit the waiver wire um, at some point within those first three weeks. And you can pick it. it his schedule does open up quite a bit after that. Um, but I think that within those first three, like it, this, this is going to be an offense where um, I think we're, we're going to want to buy low potentially, or people just start hitting the waiver wire, like Golden Tate. Sterling Shepard, these guys could start hitting the waiver wire um, after a really, really slow start. I mean, it, it's going to be tough for them to generate passing offense, I think, uh, inside that first week, three-week window. Yeah. Okay. Um, we've said it all on pace. Thorman, tell the people where they can find you, where they can find your work, where they – where anything about yourself that the people need to know, not outside of, you know, fish shows and stuff like that. <laughs> you can't find me at fish shows these days, unfortunately. Um, but you can get me at Pat underscore Thorman. Um, I'm around a lot. Uh, so, you know, obviously my, my stuff's all on uh, ETR. And, uh, yeah, reach out and, and uh, we'll chat. Yeah, during the season this year, Pat will once again be doing our weekly rankings. We'll once again be publishing snaps and pace. For the draft kit, head to establishyourrun.com. Again, it's just $34.99. Comes with a $25 Coupon to use in any FFPC league of your choosing. So, for Evan, for Pat, for Producer Luke, I am Adam. Good luck, everybody.